Welcome to this plenary lecture. The lecture is being given by John Van Rienen. John is Ronald Coase Professor at the LSE. He returned recently to Britain after a spell teaching at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. John is one of the UK's most distinguished economists. He has published very widely. He's a fellow of the British Academy and of the Econometric Society. And recently, he has been awarded a large grant by the ESRC to run a program on innovation and diffusion, which will run in parallel with the recently established Productivity Institute. Today, John's going to talk to us about finding the measure of management. As usual, if you have questions, please could you submit them through the Q&A. John will talk to us for about 45 minutes and that will leave time for questions. So John, over to you now, please. Thanks very much, Martin. Let me see if I can set up my, uh, my Zoom things. Um, uh, put myself in full screen mode. And hide those meeting controls. Okay, I think we are good to go. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk at the ESCO conference. ESCO is a fantastic organization, I think, bringing together uh, academics, researchers, and uh, statist government statisticians is really a pioneering thing to do, and it's, a, it's a, a very important way forward to improving research and also improving government uh, government statistics. Um, so I'm going to, you know, talk about an aspect of that, which is to do with um, management practices and organisation. Um, so I find, it's going to be called finding the measure of management. It's about new data for the current era we live in in in, uh, in COVID. Uh, and it's going to draw extensively on work with uh, many of my co-authors, uh, my former students, Nick Bloom, who's at Stanford, and Raphael Asadon, who's at Harvard in particular. And his, uh, you see in front of you some real and fictional managers who I will, uh, I will be uh, drawing upon. So, you know, as you know, I'm sure you've heard over the last uh, couple of days of the conference, you know, data is increasingly important to, uh, to our lives. Um, and COVID and the, the COVID pandemic has kind of highlighted the importance of data in monitoring and responding to the challenges that we face. So, you know, we've all seen these very large differences in response to the crisis across countries, and the performance has varied, you know, quite dramatically across across, across different countries. Um, and similarly, if you look at firms, you know, you know, we've seen this has been extremely difficult for many firms, but uh, some firms have managed to adapt and actually see some of the opportunities at the same time as well. And as we uh, go forward um, in the kind of, you know, next phase of the kind of pandemic, there's a big question, which I'll try and return to at the end, you know, which firms are going to survive after the pandemic and which are going to go under is a kind of really important question. Now, you know, I'm not going to talk primarily about what's happening right now. I'm going to try and draw some lessons on uh, from BCE uh, before the COVID epidemic, um, because this is where most of the data we've collected and the analysis that we've done has been so far. Um, so I'm going to be looking at um, uh, mainly firm level data on uh, management across many countries. Uh, many of these data sets are now kind of publicly available. Um, many of them are, have, have been generated from working closely with national statistical agencies like the Office of National Statistics. And one of the messages I want to try and convey in, in this talk is that there's a, a very exciting um, uh, new, new stream of this type of data to try to dig inside the black box of the firm to understand the importance of, of management towards thinking about firms and the economy as a, as a whole. So let me start off with a kind of um, a kind of big, you know, Adam Smith type of big picture uh, uh, fact sort of facts. So what this graph shows you is basically for every country in the world, um, the uh, position that each country has in terms of its GDP per worker on the horizontal axis against the total factor of productivity on the vertical axis. So total factor of productivity is kind of output after you strip out the um, things that we can measure more easily, like uh, labor and capital. 
um, and you know the, the residual of, of TFP is a, a kind of measure of efficiency, uh, if you like. So um, the it, you know you see a couple of things from this picture. So I've normalized this to be one for the US, so every other country is relative to the US. So you know the first thing that you see is that there is a you know a very strong relationship between um, the kind of wealth of nations, so GDP per, per, per worker, and total factor productivity. So TFP, this kind of a efficiency element, uh, seems to be really important in terms of understanding differences across countries. The second thing that you notice is just this incredible variation that you have across countries. So, you know, what does one over 32 mean? Well, it means that countries like Liberia, these kind of African countries like Togo, uh, it take, they, have, they have one 32nd of the, the TFP of the US. It means that it takes, uh, say, a Liberian worker a month to uh, produce what an American worker can produce in a day with the same type of uh, capital, capital equipment and input. So it, it suggests that if there are things that we could do to raise the TFP of these kind of countries, it could make an incredible dent into, into poverty and improving, improving their the kind of position in the world. So that's looking at the big picture across countries. If we look within countries, we also see very large differences of productivity across firms. So take, take the United States, for example, uh, in a typical uh, four-digit industry, it's quite a narrow industry. It'd be like, um, uh, you know, synthetic cement, for example, would be an example of, you know, a pretty narrow industry. But within one of those narrow industries, the, um, the output per worker, the, the labor productivity of an establishment in the top 10% is about four times the level of productivity of, of, a, of a plant in the bottom 10%. So that's a, a huge difference for even you know a narrowly defined industry, and even when you control for capital and uh, again like looking at the total fat productivity differences, that ratio is still a factor of two to one. So you know it's surprising because you think you know in a country like the U.S., competition would drive out these less productive firms, but you can see that even in uh, these very narrow industries, there's a you know, big variation of productivity. And if you look at other countries like our own in, in the UK or in the, even more so in developing countries, these differences are, are even larger across different firms. So a, a big question, I think, one of the first order questions in social science and economics is to say, well, you know, why are there these huge differences? And you know, there's many possible explanations for that, but the, one of the explanations I'm going to push is that I think that one of the important differences for these differences across countries and across firms within countries is to do with management. And I think we should think about some types of management practices as a form of intangible capital, or organizational capital, um, which actually enables some firms to be more successful than others. So part of management, of course, is a, a different style and different styles will be appropriate for different places. But I think part of um, uh, management practice is actually things which can raise productivity across a, a wide range of different environments, and that's that's what I'm going to uh, to look at today. Now, of course, this is this is a not this is a position not without controversy. So uh, you know, there's still a very big debate about whether management really really matters. It's uh, economists have often been quite skeptical about this, and. Uh, you know, in his uh, review of the literature, Chad said uh, the Journal of Economic Literature, no potential driving factor of productivity has seen such a high ratio of speculation to empirical study. And uh, here's a, a typical airport uh, bookstore. This is from the San Francisco bookstore. I'm often uh, in the old days before <laughs> before the pandemic. I'd often be working with uh, Nick and uh, in Stanford. So you know, I often pass through this bookstore, and you can see it's very typical. Lots of books with case studies with people like Steve Jobs or Richard Branson uh, talking about particular companies or particular people and you know these case studies are, are, are very useful you know when I was teaching uh, when I teach at business schools so I would use case studies to teach very good for illustrating theories but you know it's often very difficult to really generalize from single case studies I mean the the example which really drove this home to me was um, at the beginning of, of many of, the, of, of this work, uh, this research program I'm involved with, uh, we, were, we worked a lot with uh, consultants like McKinsey. And I remember I was at a, a presentation when I won't mention who the name of the person was, a senior partner at McKinsey was presenting the latest book and he was describing this company in the book and how fantastic it was and how they were using the best types of management practices and how innovative and dynamic it was and how we should, you know, be, company, other companies should behave more like uh, this company. And in the course of his presentation, it turned out this company was actually one called Enron. 
And uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember, Enron was, uh, at, at the time he was speaking, the CEO of Enron was being dragged away by uh, federal marshals uh, because of the accounting frauds that uh, had, uh, had, uh, had been endemic in, 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 in Enron. And, uh, you know, some people were even saying the symbol of Enron should be changed from uh, the logo it had here because it has treated its shareholders and workers so badly to something like this. So, you know, uh, it really made me uh, realize that we have to have a more systematic way of trying to get at management and practices rather than just relying solely on, on case studies. So, you know, over the last 16 years or so since then, I, I, you know, I'm going to try and talk about in this, you know, three different aspects of how we've been trying to think about management. So one is this measurement, which of course is critical for a conference like, uh, for, for like the SESCO conference. The second issue is around what the impact is of management on performance of firms and nations. And then finally, we'll talk a bit about, I hope, drivers and policies and things which influence the adoption of management practice to say you know, if these are so great well, why aren't more people adopting them and yeah as I go through this I want to I put the picture we I have here in the bottom right hand corner is an example of many of the uh, of the people who have helped us by uh, interviewing managers and talking to these managers this is a example from uh, the Indian Indian and Chinese team in the bottom right hand corner okay so um, over the course of these years we have surveyed around about over over 20,000 firms in about 35 countries and uh, every continent of the world you can kind of see the, the, the places here geocode and, and if you're interested in looking at more and finding out more uh, please go to our website um, we have all the research up there you can, if you're a firm you can benchmark yourself or the organization um, we also have policy briefs and media on, on the website. And you can download all the data as well. So the first um, uh, approach we took to this, this is the thing we now call the World Management Survey. There's kind of three steps in the methodology. So um, the first step is you know, developing a set of questions which um, from uh, discussions with consultants and interest specialists, what we try, we try to develop a set of dimensions over which we thought that given the good or service that you're, you're, you're producing or delivering public and private sector, um, how could that be done more efficiently? That's the kind of idea of productivity. And there's kind of three broad areas, you know, kind of 18 questions in these, in these three broad areas. One is around monitoring, which is really about data. And I'll give you some examples of this in, in a second, the kind of collection, the tracking of data, the communication of that data, the use of that data for getting continuous improvement, very much like the total production system. A set of questions around target setting, so how you set your goals, are they, uh, are they kind of stretching or are they impossible to reach or, or, or you know, too easy? Are they kind of a mixture of financial and non-financial, or should be long run or short run? And a set of questions around people or incentive management. So questions about how you, uh, hire people, how you deal with other performance, how you promote people, how you, how you kind of pay people. So there's a set of these questions. It's kind of the, the, the first method was delivered through a 40, about a 45 minute telephone interview of plant managers. So something between the case study approach and the more traditional kind of uh, quantitative type approach to getting data. So as I say, I'll show you a few examples of that, but even with the best questions in the world, of course, there's a concern about how we get people to participate in the interview. So, um, for these, uh, th these, these, uh, these were voluntary surveys. So uh, we introduced these as kind of a lean manufacturing interview. We got financial information from other sources. Um, and we had official endorsement from reputable institutions, the Bundesbank, the World Bank, uh, the Bank of England, for example. We found different things worked in different countries. So for example, <laughs> for example uh, in, we had this uh, letter from the Bundesbank and when the German managers got this, uh, saw this uh, letter, they were very impressed. They, you know, the double-headed eagle Russian symbol was very good for listing responses, whereas in the United States, anything to do with the government is totally scorned. And that was uh, very, you know, they, they, the Americans responded a lot better to the idea that this was like a, a MB, you know, students doing their kind of MBA summer program and that, that actually worked a lot better. Anyway, so it's very much horses for courses. And we typically get response rates around uh, kind of 40 to 50%, looking more balanced on observables. Um, the third aspect of the, the survey is that we try and get unbiased responses. They're called double blind responses. So the interviewers didn't know anything about the company performance. The managers didn't know that they were being scored on different dimensions to avoid the kind of psychological biases that we know from surveys. 
So here's an example of some of the questions. So, um, uh, uh, you know, these are scored between one and five. A low score, you know, with, this, is a, this is on the Howard's performance tract. Um, a low score would be that um, a, a firm is not really uh, tracking uh, or collecting indicators um, uh, on, on its key, on it, which are linked to its business, um, uh, business processes. A high score would be where uh, data is collected frequently and also importantly communicated formally and informally to staff in a, in a different uh, in a range of visual tools. So you know, this would be scored in a one to five by the uh, by the interviewer who's interviewing the person on the other end of, of the phone typically so you know to give you a couple of examples of what this might look like so this is in uh, uh, in, in uh, Toyota for example in the Ohio factory and you can see that there's a display board at the back of the worker which is you know showing this data in a very you know, real-time type of basis um, I should say we started off doing this in manufacturing, but over the years we've expanded this to most other sectors, hospitals, schools, retail, wholesale, and so on. Here's an example from hospitals. This is from uh, a hospital called Virginia Mason uh, in Seattle, and uh, every week um, they had this thing called the Tuesday stand-up where the doctors and the staff will look at different uh, measures of performance in the hospital and kind of talk about how things are going, try to think about how things could be improved using this kind of both communication and the ways of trying to uh, improve the, the way the hospital is run. So another example would be on promotion. So, you know, uh, a low score on promotion would be people are promoted irrespective of ability and performance. A high score would be firms who are actually trying to collect they collect information ability and effort and use that in their decision of how to promote people and reward people so that would be a high score a kind of five a five relative to a one so if you're interested we have lots of examples and lots of the questions on, on the website and uh, uh sorry i can't talk in more detail about about them but you, you know, this is the kind of example of the ideas that you'd have now i'll show you what we get from this analysis but let me first of all tell you one of the great things about doing this kind of work uh, is it's using what is quite a radical methodology for an economist which is called talking to people and when you talk to people you often find things that you weren't expecting so apologies if you've seen these quotes before but I, I, some of them I really love uh, so the uh, you know you might think that defining who owns a company is very easy well it can sometimes be a little bit difficult so uh, one production manager said uh, we are owned by the mafia and uh, the interviewer got very nervous at that point and said uh, I think that that's in the other category, although I guess I could put you down as an Italian multinational. So that is actually <laughs> how that firm is coded in, in, in the data. Uh, having having uh, lived in America now for four or five years, you'll see that you know Americans do quite American firms do quite well in many of these uh, these kind of productivity rankings, the management rankings, but not all as well. So having a daughter who's at um, uh, a government school in America, I discovered that geography lessons could do a little bit of improvement. So we were talking to uh, an interview with interviews to how many production sites do you have abroad? And a manager in, uh, in a manufacturing plant in Indiana said, well, we have one in Texas, which uh, apparently that might not be the right, that might be the right answer because <laughs> Texas is quite a different country. But uh, I was kind of surprised when we, when we heard that. So the first thing that we did was to look at just, you know, the simplest way is just take the average score for a firm across these 18 questions, score of one to five, and then average across all the firms across the entire country. So these are the kind of average scores, the kind of, you know, the league table across different countries. And you can kind of see, you know, it's not, you know, you can see kind of what you might expect, but high productivity countries like the US, Germany and Japan do very well. Uh, UK is not doing too badly. Um, then as you go down, the uh, it's doing worse than the leaders, but it's you know, certainly doing better than some of the Southern European countries, certainly than the emerging economies like China or in India. And then if you go down to the bottom, you know, are poorer countries in Africa or Latin America. So you know, if you line that up against, say, GDP per capita in, in this graph, then you kind of see a pretty strong positive correlation. So this is obviously there's nothing causal here, but it's a kind of sense check that the average management score does seem to be you know, correlated with average GDP per capita. Um, but as you know, uh, kind of more of a microeconomist, what really uh, you know, fascinates me is this variation question, whether we can speak to this kind of, uh, you know, one of the productivity puzzles of high variation. So this is the uh, variation of management scores 
within every country. So what, what this, uh, take the U US for example, what this um, histogram is doing is it's showing you, you know, the, the fact, it's unsurprising that most firms are around the average, but that you see a lot of variation. So you see a lot of firms in the right tails and a lot of firms in the left tails. So if you compare two countries like India and the United States, it's not like you know, every American firm is awesomely managed and getting a high score and every Indian firm is terrible. You know, there are there are a lot of very um, you know well managed firms in India and a lot of you know badly managed firms in the U.S. But you can see that the, the difference is that, for example, there was a much uh, thinner lower tail of American firms than there is in, in in India. So you know these firms who are scoring an average under two are not really collecting data on what goes on on the on the on the processes. They're promoting without regards to merit. They're paying people without taking ability and effort into account. Um, they're not really setting uh, set, setting sensible uh, targets or goal setting. But you know the fundamental thing is that you see masses of variation within every country, and this is a you know this is an important fact and also useful for kind of analysis of understanding kind of why this might be and what's going on. So, the, so this data looks on the face of it useful, but one of it, the problems with this is simply scale. So, you know, we have to train um, these, uh, these typically the MBA students up, um, you know, to, to do, the, do the interviews. They're relatively expensive, high human capital people. Um, so we've collected, say, 20,000 interviews over 16 years like this. If we wanted to, say, get 40,000 uh, responses in a quick wave, we would need some airport hangar. And, you know, no one at MIT or LSE has been prepared to give me this kind of uh, space or resources to, uh, unfortunately, to do that. So one of the ways that we responded to that in the last, uh, you know, in more recent years, is we've been partnering up, as I mentioned at the beginning, with different statistical agencies. So uh, the first time we did this was with the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau, and uh, we call this we call this MOPS, the Management and Organizational Practices Survey, and we had a, a wave uh, delivered to about forty-eight thousand uh, manufacturing plants asking about management practices in 2010 and retrospectively in 2005. So this was seen as quite successful. We had a second wave covering 2015 and 2010 practices and we've raised money now and we're, we're going to have a, a third wave um, next year which will cover practices you know as happening in 20, 2010, 2020 and 2019 and this is going to have some COVID related questions as well to kind of address some of the things I raised at the beginning. Um, one of the, the nice advantages about the working with the census is we have this thing, I don't know if you can read it, it says your response is required by law so that is very good for your sample response rates. So we get pretty high sample response rates for this, uh, the, this survey. So it's a closed survey, so we can't be as probing as we could in the in the world management survey. But we, what we've done is we developed questions which are very similar to what we were asking in the world management survey. So we ask about you know the number of performance indicators you are you are kind of collecting on like production cost wastes quality and so on for these two different years. We ask questions about um, you know were people aware of these production targets? So. You know, um, you know, was it just around senior managers or was it more generally spread? So this is uh, Ron Jarman, who uh, was part of the team, who was uh, uh, formerly head of the U.S. Census Bureau. This was actually an American Economic Association when we were in, uh, we went to the back of the Marriott Hotel, and we were very impressed that they were they would score quite quite well on the collecting and and, and uh, showing some of this information on their, their production targets. So we also have um, subsequently done some met with other statistical agencies, so in particular with the ONS, and we're very thankful for working with the ONS and the ESRC for funding this. Um, in 2017, we did a survey of uh, 25,000 firms regarding the management practice in 2016. This was including non-manufacturing as well as manufacturing, so that was another additional interesting dimension. Uh, to to the the survey, which went beyond what we did in the U.S. work, uh, we basically use the same questions in the U.K. as the U.S. So we have a good basis of comparability, and we have also you know raised money um, with a team, including uh, many you know, ESCO uh, leaders like Rebecca Riley, to run uh, another another wave of this um, for later this year uh, using the ABS sampling frame. 
Um, this is a voluntary survey, so response rates are lower, but we know they're non-responders, so we can do some weighting to, to deal with any non-random response. So at this point, we now have, uh, th th this shows you the countries which have been running these kind of mop surveys. Uh, so these, uh, these kind of surveys in conjunction with the government. And I'm going to also draw on some of the work uh, from those more general uh, MOP surveys in, in terms of the results I'm going to show you now. So this is work with uh, Scott Olmarker and many others in a paper which uh, we're working on called the Natural Laws of Management. So let's move on to just um, showing you the, the data and actually seeing whether there's you know, any potential impact of these practices on performance. So of course the first thing that we did was we, you know, we took, going back to the World Management Survey across uh, these 35 countries, we um, got the average management score by firm and we correlated this with the av a measure of the average total factor productivity for each of those firms. So we have a lot of rich data um, from the uh, counts of these firms and also from the World Management Survey and not just um, uh, kind of fixed uh, capital, but also measures of skills or hours, other things. So this is the kind of residual after you control for those things. And what you can see is that, um, you know, the firms which have higher management scores tend to have much higher total factor productivity. This is the kind of uh, lowest non-parametric you know, non, you know, non plot. So you can see it's a broadly monotonic type of positive relationship. Um, if you look at the UK MOPS um, data, and again, this is just putting the management score in deciles. You can also see a positive relationship, particularly strong in the upper tail part of the distribution in, in the UK. But you know, another uh, you know, sense in which we, this is labor productivity since uh, we don't have such good measures of capital, but you can see this kind of positive relationship between labor productivity and management in the UK MOPs. Uh, this is the US um, MOPs. Again, this is a kind of, kind of strong positive relationship between management and productivity. Now, of course, if you talk to many business people, they say, no, what I care about is not productivity, I care about my profits. So we also look at a number of other kind of outcomes. So if you look at uh, profitability, you can see that the um, firms with high management scores tend to be more profitable, they tend to grow faster, they tend to be more likely to export. Interestingly, they also tend to be more innovative as measured by the R&D intensity or the patent intensity. So it's not simply that, um, you know, one, one concern is maybe you're very good at improving efficiency in your firm, but that comes at the expense of uh, creativity or innovations, at least in terms of these correlations. It looks like having you know, strong management practices actually may help you run your R&D labs as well as help you run your you know, production part of your plants as well. Um, another measure is just size. So, um, you know, you might, you know, an obvious relationship from a kind of Schumpeterian point of view is that the, if you're better managed, you should be able to just get larger, you should be able to grow. And if you're worse managed, you should shrink and exit through a kind of process of creative destruction. So one thing is just to look at the relationship with the management and size. So you can see that the, uh, the, the you know, the well-managed firms tend to be larger. Um, you know, so I'll come back to the problems of reverse causality and other reasons for this. But you know, just looking at the raw data, you do see this relationship where the better managed firms are, la are larger. Interestingly, if you say compare that across countries, this is looking in Pakistan um, for the other, for not for you know where we've also run the mops. You also see a positive relationship, but the slope is much more shallow. And you know, one possible explanation of this is that you know, if you're a well-managed firm in Pakistan, because there are so many um, frictions in the marketplace, there is you know, less competition, there's more regulations, there's more corruption, there's more problems with growing larger, um, then it's much harder for you know, even a well-managed firm in Pakistan to get to get to be the kind of the scale that you think it, it, it could potentially get. Whereas the US has a much stronger forces of reallocation are enabling their better managed firms to get larger. Uh, so if you look across countries, you also see this positive relationship, but it does vary a lot across different countries. And that's, a, you know, that's an aspect that we can, we can uh, exploit and look at. So you know, the, US, the UK, for example, is, you know, between Pakistan and uh, the United States also has a shallower slope than the, the US does. Now, of course, a big problem with all those correlations I've showed you is that you know, none of these are necessarily causal. There could be a reverse causality. Maybe if I'm doing well, I can afford to hire better consultants and some prison management practices, or there could be a third factor that I'm not properly controlling for in this. But in the last few years, there has been a kind of um, 
a huge flourishing of randomized control trials and quasi experiments, which has tried to look at some of these um, management practices that I've been describing to see whether they have a, a causal impact on productivity. So um, I've, I've listed quite a few of these here. They run across many different countries and many different industries. Um, the uh, the Ghiacelli paper is quite nice. This uses it Italian data uh, in the Marshall Plan, which had a big um, improving management element to it. And she shows you using uh, firms who applied versus firms who just uh, got on the program and just didn't. The fact there seemed to be a large causal effect on management and on, on productivity. Um, the, uh, there's papers on teaching, papers on car parts, papers in, uh, in parts of Africa, papers on Virgin Atlantic. Um, Nick, uh, you know, Nick led on this uh, maybe most famous uh, randomized control trial in uh, India, where we partnered with the World Bank and got um, them to market a program uh, where they got free um, consultancy from Accenture to implement the kind of Bloom, Bannerin and management practices. And we kind of injected those management practices into a kind of treatment group who were randomized into the program versus a control group who were randomized out who just got um, a basic set of uh, help so we could get their data. And if you compared the, uh, the treatment group to the control group, there were very big improvements in management and also very big improvements in productivity. So the productivity increased by something like two standard deviations, the profits went up by something like $350,000. And those improvements actually persisted even up to seven years later. Um, there was some, uh, some fade out, some fall back, but there was still a very large difference between treatment and control, control seven years later. So these, um, an important part of um, these practices do appear to have uh, a causal impact on on productivity and performance across the world. So given that, we can then return to the kind of more macro question about you know, how important are these in explaining some of those cross-country patterns that I began with. So uh, in order to do that, we, you know, we have to make a lot of assumptions and there's kind of two kind of key steps. I mean, one step is that we have to think about what is the kind of size-weighted management quality in a, in a particular country. So because of this reallocation force, um, it, the unweighted average management score I showed you at the beginning um, underestimates the importance of management in some countries because uh, in countries where uh, the large firms can get, get to be bigger, this size-weighted manager will give them, if you like, a bigger stock of, uh, of, 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 uh, of manager or capital. So we calculate the size-weighted um, management, and then we try to impute the impact of that on productivity using various uh, measures of the, the impact uh, on productivity from the randomized control trials and other, other kinds of evidence. So this is a, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a rougher kind of estimate but I think it's, um, it's, it can be very revealing. So, so it, it, it's in the spirit of what's sometimes called development accounting that uh, my colleague Francesco Casali has done. So this is what it kind of looks like. So um, these gray lines are normalized. This is the TFP differences I showed you at the beginning. So it's normalized to be 100 in the US and um, the other countries have lower TFP than the US. So here's Britain, for example, we have about say 15% lower TFP uh, than the US does. And then the orange lines use that calculation I just showed you to say how much of that difference can you account for with management practices. And on average, we can explain across our countries about a third of the difference of these TFP gaps with the US with our management practice. So you know, there's a big chunk of you know, things which are not to do with the way we measure management. I mean, there may be other kinds of management practices, there's other, obviously other factors, but the third is quite a big amount. So that suggests to me that, you know, management, you know, potentially is a very, is, is a very important factor in understanding some of these TFP differences. Now, of course, it's much less important to say in, you know, African countries, there's a lot of other problems. And it's much more important, say, in a country like Britain, where it explains about half of the difference, or Euro you know, the European difference, where it explains, say, 60% of France. Um, so, I, so, you know, for, for many of the countries, maybe that you know, we're most interested in, like our own other European countries, management does seem to be very important. Uh, one other thing I should say is that of, you know, of this 30%, we can decompose it into how much of it is to do with the, just the 
unweighted average mantle score and how much has to do with the fact that some countries seem to be better reallocating more outputs to the better managed, the more productive firms. And of that 30%, about uh, 10 percentage points is to do with that reallocation effect. And about uh, the other 20% is just to do the unweighted average. So, you know, a full, you know, third of a third is actually to do with that way that the economy is better at maybe reallocating output to the better managed firms. Okay, so let me end up in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes talking about um, drivers and uh, policy. So a kind of obvious question to ask is, well, you know, if it is the case that um, having these better management practices improves the bottom line of profitability and improves productivity, why aren't all firms kind of adopting them? You know, why, you know, surely this should be something which uh, is, you know, is adopted by everybody. And, you know, that lies behind it. Why should there be so much variance? It's so obvious. Why aren't you all adopting the same practices? And, I, you know, there's lots of different answers to this. It's the same kind of question you often ask when you say, well, why aren't firms all adopting the same technologies which seem to be improving uh, performance? And, you know, one way to kind of frame that and think about that question is um, there's a very nice paper by Jan uh, Rifkin from Harvard in, in Science um, who, who puts it in, you know, four different points, which we, we adopt here. So one is that, you know, I may not even know how badly managed my firm is. You know, I may actually think if I'm a, you know, a, a, a small, medium-sized company in these textile plants outside Mumbai where we did the randomized control trial, you know, I might think I'm actually pretty good because I don't actually have experience or exposure to better match to really good world-class management practices. So one is a kind of radical form of information on, on, on lack of knowledge, which I just don't know I have poor management practices. The second thing was I may know that I'm badly managed, but I don't know how to change it. I may not have the right human capital, um, you know, if you think parts of the consultancy industry are all about trying to help firms change, change is not e often not easy. It requires a lot of information. So that's the second reason. A third reason is, well, I may know I'm badly managed. I may know what to do, but I may not have the right set of incentives to make that change. And that's kind of where a lot of um, economists' work, my own work, is focused on. So, you know, there may be comp market competition may be weak or the kind of governance of the firm may not be very strong. There may not be strong incentives to kind of uh, improve productivity in the firm because there's, the firm is not well governed. So there's a whole range of factors which you know, is, is kind of meat and drink to economists. But finally, there's, a, there's something which has, has not been studied so much and my, uh, you know, uh, my former colleague Bob Gibbs at MIT always emphasizes, which is that you know, when you make change, in an organization, it's not just a decision theoretic problem. In other words, it's not just the CEO who says, do this and everything gets done. As we all know, if you're working in a big organization, you have to take a lot of other people along with you. So there's a kind of political economy of the firm, which actually is very hard because you have to try to balance competing interests. You have to get um, lots of different groups to change. You know, those of you who work in universities will be very familiar. You know, it's, <laughs> the, uh, the dean of the university may well want something done, but if uh, the department doesn't want to go along with it, it's very difficult to make those changes, those changes happen. So that issue of relational contracts, organizational economics, I think is a really important area, an understudied area for these things. So let me just end, I'm going to show you some, you know, some, a little bit of data on where we try to think about these things. So let's start off, first of all, with human capital. So it's kind of unsurprising in a way, if you look at the correlation, um, the firms which have more skilled uh, managers and in fact non-managers, so managers, non-managers on the left, managers on the right, so this is measured just the fraction of a college degree, tend to have much higher management scores. So, you know, the ability of the, man of the managers and indeed of the non-managers if, the, if they're higher skilled is really important in terms of understanding whether some firms are better or worse management scores. So, you know, that's, a, that's kind of a, an important fact. You know, of, of course, it, you worry that you know, maybe this is not, um, you know, reflecting all the different elements of... Uh, of you know what people's skills are, we we did one study which tried to get a little bit more at this by looking at matched worker firm data. So the nice thing about matched worker firm data is you can follow the same workers and managers over time, so you can try and get a much better measure of the 
unobserved skills by seeing the workers who managed to get and managers who got got higher wages no matter which work firm they worked for. Um, so we we did this using uh, basically all West German workers from 1975 onwards and matched that with the management data. And uh, what this graph at the bottom shows you is that you know this is the basic correlation between productivity and the management score. And then when you control for um, uh, non manual ability, that explains um, some of it, so maybe 20%. When you control for managerial ability as well, both the observed and unobserved part, this now explains a lot of the effect, but it's still about only about half. So what it says is about half of the reason why um, you see this positive correlation between management practices and TFP is due to just the skills, the atoms of human capital of the man, particularly the managers, but also the workers. But it's more than that. It's also how those people are put together and uh, work together in an organization, the kind of uh, the DNA or the, or the culture of the firm. So, you know, it is the talent is very important, but it's not just about the talent. It's also about how you manage that talent and it gets put together. Um, what about information? Um, so, you know, we asked the question at the end of the of the of the, the world management survey. You know, excluding yourself, how well managed would you say your firm is on a scale of one to ten? Or one is the worst practice, five is the average, or ten is the best practice? This is trying to get at your kind of perceptions of your, uh, you know, how how well self aware are you? Um, now, it may be unsurprising to most of you that most people think they're pretty awesome. So most people think they're way above average, uh, just in the same way most people think they are much better drivers than everybody else or their kids are much cleverer than everybody else. Um, so there's clearly a cognitive bias over my, you know, my absolute ranking. But you can still use the relative ranking. So you might still think the relative, the relative um, perception is important. It turns out it isn't. So people, you know, this is the correlation between your self-scored management versus your profit. So we saw before that, you know, if you use our management score, there's a very strong relationship. There's there's basically no relationship here. It's like this kind of machine gun type of plot. So, you know, I, I take from this that there is a lot of, a big lack of information and knowledge that people have about how well or badly managed that they are. Um, another way of looking at this is to look at multinationals. So um, what this shows you is the average management scores of, uh, in the red, domestic firms. This looks a lot like the graph I showed you before. And then in the dark color, the, the kind of black, this is the average management score for foreign affiliates of foreign multinationals. So what this is saying is that um, the, the subsidiaries and the, the kind of transplants of foreign multinationals tend to be well managed no matter where they're located. And that, what that suggests is that you know, multinationals are a way of actually transplanting better management practices from one part of the world to somewhere else through the information they have and uh, the capabilities they have. Um, we, we, we tried to press this a, a one step further to go a little bit more in the causal direction by um, using what's sometimes called this kind of million dollar plant design. So um, this is from the US uh, MOPS data now. We could uh, look at when a multinational company, a big multinational company comes to a particular county in the US and we look at the uh, management and performance of the, the other establishments who are you know, not connected with the multinational before and after the multinational comes there. So what we see is that when the multinational enters, the, uh, the other plants around it, the other establishments around it, tend to improve the productivity and their management very dramatically after the multinational comes. So this is just showing you the event study that you know, there's this big uh, positive treatment effect, both the management size and also productivity. Um, so in terms of understanding, you know, part of this is just looking at what maybe we're looking at what the multinational does and copying their practices. Part of it may also come from the uh, movements of people around. So maybe some of the managers and workers switch from working in the multinational to working in local, local firms. And this is another way of spreading um, better management practices. So there seems to be some evidence for that uh, very strongly from the kind of MOPS data. A third thing is competition. This is one of the strongest things we found in a number of our studies. In areas where there's more competition, you tend to see much better management practices, both because of a selection effect, because the, the less well-managed firms get driven out, but also from a kind of, uh, you know, what the Americans call 
boot up the ass effect that the tougher competition, you know, forces managers to kind of get their act together and improve, uh, improve their practices. Um, governance is also very important. So uh, we've consistently found that, you know, the problem is if you're a family owned firm, um, then that by itself is not a problem. But if you're a family owned firm and you put a, a CEO in charge of the company, especially if it's your eldest son or eldest grandson, that tends to be associated with, with, uh, with much worse management practices. And, you know, many reasons for that, you know, one reason of course is that of all the people who would be the best person to run the firm, the chance that your elder son are, are not uh, not necessarily the, the only choice. Um, and there's some very nice work by um, uh, two of the two of the kind of collaborators in the WMS, uh, my you know, former student, Steve Wilson Skur, who used the uh, whether you, whether you look at the founder was the founder's first child a, a male or a female. If it was a, a boy then it's much more likely to be passed down the family line. So use that as a kind of exogenous instrument, natural experiment, and they find that you know, the results are actually even stronger in terms of the negative effect of um, family, family run firms on, on management. Okay, so I think I'm more or less on our time. So let me just end with uh, a couple of thoughts. So you know, going back to where I started, you know, the question is, you know, will these better managed firms survive the COVID shock to a much better extent than other firms. I mean, my, my gut feeling is the answer is yes, um, because we do have evidence that um, firms with more, these more structured management practices make better use of opportunity. So from looking um, from other evidence of the adoption of new technologies like information technology, um, we found that the firms which had better management practices tended to be the ones who could improve the productivity from using new technology um, the most strongly sometimes this is called organizational technology complementarity and you know that's because you know when you're using new technology it's often just not about the technology it's about the other changes that you need to make within your firm in order to make best use of uh, of that that new opportunity you need to change the way that you maybe organize your uh, relationships within the firm have different types of workers new types of skills and you know I suspect that this may also be part of the reason why so far we've only seen disappointing productivity effects of things like artificial intelligence they haven't been reflected in our productivity numbers you know part of the reason for that might be just as it was with electricity and it was with computers you need to make a lot of organizational changes to make best use of these new technologies and indeed when we think about hospitals and how you know they respond to the COVID shock another interesting hypothesis would be are the hospitals which had better management practices the ones who are better at coping with the kind of shock of dealing with the, with the pandemic or not one difference of course between you know, the technology shock and the COVID shock is that the technology is kind of a positive shock it's an opportunity code is a kind of negative shock we we do have a little bit of evidence of this from looking at the great depression uh great recession of the financial crisis so in some work with philip Agion, we found that um uh the firms actually who responded better were the firms who actually gave more decision making power to um more local managers and uh and senior local employees and that tended to be because in a time where there's lots of you know lots of things going on that you don't understand actually having people on the ground making decisions and being empowered to make decisions is very important so better managed firms tend to be more decentralized but not always so i think a, a very live question as we as we get more data on what's happened during the pandemic is to actually look at this question again about decentralization management and performance and uh, lots of important areas for future research, uh, both in terms of thinking about different policies, uh, different theories, collecting better data. But I think I kind of more or less done now. I just you know end up with this slide that I think I, you know, I hope I've uh, given you some evidence that some core management practice can be measured. You know, not perfectly, but uh, we made progress doing that, and it enables us to capture some deep and rich information on firms. It, management seems to matter both at the micro and the macro level in terms of understanding the spread of productivity and it appears to be systematically correlated with different drivers like skills information competition governance regulation these things are you know are things we can we can change there are things where government and businesses can intervene and actually do things to improve management and therefore productivity so i think there's a very rich agenda for future research both in terms of collecting data 
but also in terms of analysis and also in terms of policy and, and particular around this COVID question. So I will, uh, I will end, end there and I'll end with uh, some, some quotes to, to finish with. Okay, uh, over to you, Martin, I think. Well, thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating lecture. Whenever people talk about productivity and what can be done to improve Britain's position, I'm inevitably reminded of some comments that Robin Matthews, the Cambridge economist, made in one of his lectures 45 years ago. He said then in 1976 that uh, you know, Britain had had a productivity problem for 100 years, lots of policies had been tried, and none of them had worked. And I suppose that was a reasonable summary, but what you've shown us today is that uh, actually explaining to people how to manage businesses better based on what you mentioned in India can actually work. Whether it'll be enough to close the productivity gap, well, plainly not, because as you said, management explained only a part of the productivity gap with the United States, but it does suggest that uh, there's room for going quite a long way. I'd like to ask you more about that, but before that, I should hand over to Alex, who has a question. Alex, please. Yeah. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. So uh, I have a short question. Did you attempt to study um, organizational and ICT complementarity? And uh, whether you would be interested to, because I find uh, this area of ICT technologies and management practices studies uh, really important and uh, building upon Martin's uh, comment is that obviously uh, GDP gap is partly explained by productivity, but it's all, I personally claim that it's also partly explained by technologies used by the firm. But also, if we add a complementarity of technologies and uh, management practices, maybe we can, you know, uh, go towards really closing the gap, the productivity gap, because uh, this complementarity can explain a lot to my to my mind. Yes, thanks, thanks, Alex. Now that that's a that's a great question. I, I that's what I was kind of rushing through a little bit at the end, but we have we have done some some work on looking at that complementarity between. Uh, technology and, and organization management, management practices and uh, one of the you know we one of the findings which is I think consistent with what other people have found is there is this very important interaction effect so in particular uh, we looked at um, you know this period um, from the kind of late in the mid 90s to the mid 2000s when there was a you know a big increase of uh, IT adoption uh, across the Western world and we looked at and we showed as other people have showed that the impact of information technology varied a lot in terms of productivity across different firms uh, and so on and we showed that um, there was a strong complementarity between management practices in particular people management practices so you know how flexible you were with your workforce how you gave incentives to uh, your, your your kind of employees, how you dealt with talent. There's a very strong uh, complementarity between those people management practices and the use of IT. Um, and we, you know, we did various calculations, but we thought that you know, one of the things that people know is that if you looked at, over that period, the US had a kind of productivity acceleration, whereas Europe um, didn't or didn't kind of came came later on. And part of that gap, we, we calculated about half of that gap was due to the fact that you had these different management practices in European firms and in American firms. So I, I totally think that this um, complementarity thing is extremely important. And it, I think it helps inform some of these other puzzles. So, you know, why, you know, don't we see yet such big impacts of things like artificial intelligence on productivity? I think part of it is that we need to think about how we you know, make organizational changes to use those new technologies rather than thinking we just buy them and plonk them down and somehow they're going to create big productivity benefits. Okay, now I've got a, another question from Jonathan Haskell. So please could you connect to Jonathan? Uh, hello, John. I don't know. 
I, I don't know if you can hear me. I, um, I can hear you, John. How are you? Uh, fine, thank you. Thanks very much for the lecture, jo John. You, you made this fascinating comment earlier on about how many of these management practices seem very specific in some way. So management at an Amazon, you know, fulfillment center seems to be very different to management at a university. Um, and then you also made the comment that your colleagues were working on this notion of management as a kind of relational contract. Managers have to, you know, do all sorts of political jobs about uh, pulling, uh, you know, the rest of the, the rest of the staff with them and so forth. So can you talk a little bit more about what kind of work that's been done to uncover that? Um, and, and is it the case that one might think of the very specific forms of management which differs a lot across institutions as being somehow related to that, the politics and those types of relational considerations. Thanks very much. No, that's, a great, that's, a great, that's a great question. So, um, I mean, I, I, I think the, the, the way we appro we've approached this was to start off, when we started off, was to try and actually think of aspects of management which are not so specific, which are more general, which could you know, across a range of different environments be thought to improve productivity. So, you know, the idea of when you're thinking of promoting somebody, trying to take into account, get information on the, you know, pr their effort, their ability, have, you know, say a 360 type of you know, degree to get information. I think that, you know, as opposed to just promoting on tenure and nothing else. I think, you know, those are things which most people would think are going to be good in a whole variety of contexts you know, whether it's amazon or you know a toyota manufacturing plant or uni or university environment so we try to get things which are more general i mean there were a couple of questions which were specific like two or two of the 18 were more specific to manufacturing but most of them were pretty general um now that's not to say that some may be more important in some some areas than others but we tried in our, in our first way to get things which were which were likely to be generally good for productivity now as we've gone on of course there's a there's a kind of question about you know could we go further than that and actually look at things which are uh, not you know are wider so you know strategic questions you know, maybe handling political problems in the firm strategic, you know what should you be doing about you know um take going into new markets or, or taking over uh, other firms so there's a there's an initiative called the world strategy survey that uh, Raffaella is leading on which is trying to do that on broader things than just the the kind of more um, operational type if you like of the manager questions that we kind of focus focus on and they're making some progress in in, in doing that I, I, I what one thing I think to emphasize is that these kind of questions now have been used you know the, the Carol Proper has a paper using them in universities uh, Imran Razul has a paper using these in the Nigerian civil service um, they seem to be informative across a kind of pretty wide range of different uh, environments so you know I, I'm hope, I hopeful that we've we managed to pick on something which is you know is is useful but I, I do think you're right that as we go forward we need to kind of broaden the horizons to look at other types of uh, of management practices which go wider wider than the ones that we've, we've looked at so far okay well we have no a question now from Keshab please uh, uh, John thank you very much uh, I have a very simple question in the micro literature that uh, we often see that a very generous payment to the CEOs lead to the better performance of a company so do you think that is the uh, i mean do you can can you generalize that that uh, it leads to the better management score um <laughs> thank you for that question uh so i've i've worked on ceo pay so i i i i know the i know the literature a bit um so i my reading of the literature is just giving managers more pay giving ceos yeah. more pay actually doesn't necessarily lead to uh, better management practices. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I think what's to my take on, on, the, on the literature is that it's kind of, uh, it's, it's some relates to how you pay managers. So, you know, if you're, if you're actually tying the pay to um, 
some types of performance and have good governance in the firm, that can actually lead to, to um, better productivity. I think, you know, there are certainly examples where you can pay you know, CEOs quite a lot and that doesn't seem to create um, great, great outcomes. Having said that, we have looked at some of the role of C, you know, CEOs and you know, there is some evidence that it is, it is important who the CEO is in terms of understanding the kind of quality of, of management. So, you know, different measures of um, CEO quality um, do seem to be correlated with um, the, uh, the, the kind of management, management practices in, in the firm. Um, whether that's, you know, that, that's sometimes remuneration related, but sometimes it's to do with their, their kind of skills. Um, so the leadership does seem to be important. And, and I, I hinted at in, in the talk, but you know, it, I, probably the best way we've tried to do that, and that's not just because I, I actually think, you know, there is this thing in economics that goes back to the Lucas 1978 model that somehow a firm is just the talent of the CEO and that's it. And I think, although the CEO is important, that really underestimates the importance of all the employees within the firm, both the managerial employees and the non-managerial employees. So that German study I mentioned, what we tried to do there was to somehow to get at the atoms of human capital across managers and workers through looking at their previous pay in different organizations. And we showed that that is really important. So, you know, it certainly explains, say, maybe a half of the relationship between the management practice score and productivity. But there is another large fraction, which is not simply to do with those atoms of human capital. You can get really good people, as we know, <laughs> put them in a dysfunctional organization and they just won't perform as well as they do in a, in a well-functioning organization. So I think it, it goes beyond the leadership and beyond the individual human capital is actually often how those put together. These, these are important, but it goes, you know, if you think of Toyota, so even when, you know, Mr. Toyota, you know, shook off his morsel coil. <laughs> uh, Toyota remains a very successful company. So I, I think it's something to do with the way that uh, you maybe knit a culture in a company or organization, which goes beyond who the, the, the leader of that, uh, that organization is. But I totally agree. It's a really fast, it's a very important area for, for research in this, in this, this area. Well, thank you very much, John. Do you have any final thoughts that you would like to make before we wrap up, um, I don't know if I have any final thoughts. I could give you a, <laughs> I could give you a final quote if you can see this. So this is from an interview uh, in, in, in the Indian hospital. He said, "Do you offer acute care? Yes, ma'am, we do. Do you have an orthopedic department? Yes, ma'am, we do. Cardiology department? Yes. Great. Can you connect me to the uh, to the senior manager? Sorry, ma'am, I'm a patient here. <laughs> this is this is very much, uh, you know." Uh, what you learn when you uh, go out and do this thing about talking to people that uh, you discover things that you weren't, uh, weren't expecting to. And uh, I think that's uh, one of the lessons to draw from, draw from this kind of research. Well, thank you very much indeed for what's been an absolutely fascinating presentation and giving us all to think about and given, given us all a lot to think about.